the biggest X-class flare of this solar cycle thus far brings us a super solar storm that could give us a bit of aurora. Those stories and more in the spotlight. Space weather this week starts off the new year with a bang. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we have been paying close attention to this coronal hole because it's been sending us some fast solar wind and giving us a little bit of aurora. In fact, it's bumped us up to active conditions as of right now. But that's not the only story. We also had a filament launch here in the south. Whoosh, there it goes. We had another filament launch in the north. You can see it go whoosh right there. We even had a third filament right in this region that also lifted off in a glorious display. Whoosh, there it goes right there. But that is not the only story as well. If we recall, we can see all the bright regions on this limb. Last week, this was the set of regions that was gonna, that was a big dark cluster that was rotating into Earth view. Well, here they come. Region 3536 is our old friend 3514, and it did not disappoint. Late on the 31st, it fires off the biggest, bam, right there, X-class flare of our solar cycle. This was nearly an X-5 class flare, an X-4.98, and it gave us a huge radio blackout over the Western Hemisphere, uh, mainly centered in, in the Southern Hemisphere, but we, it actually caused issues for South America as well as North America and even Australia and a bit of the Asian Pacific, as you can see right there. In fact, this uh, radio uh, blackout was not just an R3 level, but it actually gave us radio bursts clear up into about 200, a little bit higher than 200 megahertz. We saw it in Mexico. We also saw the radio burst in uh, Australia, here's a strong radio burst up to 80 megahertz. But then when we look at even higher frequencies, you can see it goes up even higher up into the mid 200s before it's, you know, kind of fizzles out. So we didn't get anything up to affect GPS level signals or affecting anything like the ADS-B transponders for aircraft, thank goodness. But it does hearken and let you know that these radio bursts can get pretty intense. Even in America, in Arizona, we saw some strength in those radio bursts in there up to about 60 or even higher uh, megahertz. So definitely radio uh, communications has been impacted from this radio, radio burst, but it has died off. And then on top of that, we had a massive solar storm launch. This was a super solar storm that, of course, you'd think is just going to go eastward of, I mean, yeah, eastward of Earth because it's basically on the limb of the sun. But when we take a look at the blast wave, and this is uh, due to Halo CME, uh, who is part of the AIA team on the SDO spacecraft, you can see this incredible coronal wave that ripples all the way to center disk on the sun. That means that the structure is, the solar storm is actually light, uh, wide enough that it could actually impact Earth. So when we take a look at the coronagraphs, now the coronagraphs here show, you see this big halo right here, it begins to launch outward. This thing becomes a full, like a major partial halo. It's covering almost 180 degrees off this disk, which once again means we could easily get clipped by this solar storm. So believe it or not, despite the fact that it's on the east limb, this superstorm is big enough to give us a bit of a bump. So we are going to be expecting that uh, here over the next 24 to 48 hours. Now, as we continue watching this set of regions rotate into view, there are several of these regions uh, that are following suit. They are also being a bit flare active. And you can see as we take a look at the uh, magnetic mixing of these regions, there's a lot of complexity there and it's continuing to remain. Even through the big X-class flare, it did not calm down this magnetic mixing. So it does look like this region and the couple regions behind it are going to be uh, big flare players easily over the rest of this week. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders and even you GPS users, be aware we could have R3 level radio blackouts over the next few days and possibly longer. Now returning to that super solar storm that was launched with that big X class flare, we take a look at our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. Now, as we set this solar storm model in motion, you're going to see that solar storm launch very quickly. This thing is 
fast. Look at this. You can see a lot of the white color here. That's almost 900 kilometers a second. So this is a very quick solar storm. This is why it's going to impact us soon. Now, the main part of this structure is uh, moving to the east of us, but you see that it's going to clip Earth basically around 7 UT on the second. It's not expected to be a very strong storm, but it will wallop us pretty hard once it hits. It's just going to be pretty thin at this point, and so it's not going to last all that long. But I have a feeling that this structure is going to be slowed down for two reasons. One is the slower solar wind ahead of it is really going to kind of decelerate this structure quite a bit. And also because the main bulk of this structure is going east of Earth, it may take a while for these edges to actually reach Earth. So that both of those things combined may mean that we're not going to get hit at 7 UT, but actually a bit later. In fact, as we switch to our NASA's pr uh, prediction model, this is the same model ENLO, but NASA's running it now. Again, you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as I set this solar storm, in a uh, model in motion, you can see that solar storm once again being quite quick. This time they have it a little bit more east directed than toward Earth. Nonetheless, you can see this structure. It does impact Earth, but the main bulk of it is already past uh, Earth's orbit by the time the edge of this actually causes us any trouble. In fact, if you look at the uh, impact footprint here, you can actually see that impact footprint doesn't show any impact until about 1800 UTC on the second. So we do have a bit of a window here for this extreme solar storm to hit us. Again, it's not expected to be a huge impact because it is just the, the hairy edge, the flank of this structure that will be hitting us at all. So don't expect a lot of aurora, but expect aurora to brighten quite quickly when it does hit and get out there and enjoy the views. And don't be surprised if it dims down quite quickly. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, and by the 8th, our moon will be less than 12% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like maybe some aurora, and remember the quadrantids meteor shower is still active, you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Now, switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that big solar storm that was associated with that X-class flare. And at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting major storm conditions with up to about a 60% chance of a severe storm at high latitudes. By the third, we should be uh, kind of calming down to minor storm conditions because this we're not expecting this storm to last all that long. By the fourth, things should definitely be settling back down and getting back to mostly quiet. But remember, because we have that cluster of active regions that are very uh, flare active and are launching solar storms, this latter half of this uh, solar storm forecast you should definitely take with a grain of salt. It could change very quickly. Now, if we switch to solar storm conditions at mid-latitudes, we're only expecting active conditions, but we have up to about a 25% chance of a minor storm. And then by the third, things will probably be settling down. Now, we do still have a chance of a minor storm. Remember, this storm could actually hit Earth a little bit later than anticipated. So if that's the case, it would shift this kind of one day forward. But still, as we go into the rest of the week, expect that conditions could change very quickly because we do have those big regions on the sun that are shooting solar storms and they're going to be rotating into that Earth strike zone pretty soon. So aurora photographers, if you don't get a good show with this particular storm, well, just hang in there. There might be one coming. Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we do have a few active regions in Earth view. That's why our solar flux is remaining high. You'd expect it to be a bit higher, but there's really not that many active regions. The main one is region 3536, as you have saw with that big X-class flare. This means moderate noise is remaining on the dayside radio bands, and that will continue. In fact, NOAA is giving us about a 60% chance of an R1 to R2 level radio blackout. That's an M-class flare, and even a 25% chance of X-class flares over the next three days. And I've extended that out to be about 50% for R1 to R2 level radio blackouts as we move into the end of the week and calming down a little bit with the X-class flares, mainly because the complexity, the magnetic complexity of region 3536 will likely be settling down here over the next 
few days, uh, but expect radio blackouts to continue to be on the menu on Earth's day side. Now, as we take a look at our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, we are dealing with a minor radiation storm right now. This is because of that big X-class flare in these new regions that have been rotating into view. They've been very flare active and they've been launching radiation storms. Now, we're sitting at the D2 minor range right now. This is at flight level 360 for you aviators. And we're sitting at the elevated level, but I believe that by the second, I'm going to deviate with Noah's predictions and say that we are probably going to pop up to the S1 level just momentarily as the big shockwave from that big solar storm passes over us. And then we should drop back down to elevated levels uh, easily uh, through the rest of the second and possibly into the third before things go back to the D1 normal range where everything is completely quiet. However, because we do have that big flare player in Earth view, it is still a risk for radiation storms. So Noah's giving us about a 25% chance of an S1 or S2 radiation storm uh, over the next three days. And that will probably diminish as we move into the weekend just a little bit. But remember, as region 3536 rotates to the sun's west limb, that risk will likely rise again. So we're likely going to be in the yellow here all week for radiation storm risk. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew as well as pilots, Please uh, take this into your flight plans and uh, be careful and make sure you check your ICAO advisories often. So the space weather this week has gotten very active. We are anticipating the hit from that big solar storm that was launched back on New Year's Eve. Now it's going to be a glancing blow, so it may not last all that long. But Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could start off the new year in a beautiful way with some gorgeous Aurora views. Aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, we could get a fleeting show, but only if you're dedicated should you chase. And now amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, with that big cluster of active regions rotating into Earth view and old region 3514 kicking it off with X-class flares, that tells you that R3 level radio blackouts are back on the menu and they're even coming up into the VHF level, possibly a potential for UHF level disruptions as well. So understand on Earth's day side, you're going to have these radio blackouts and it's probably going to last all week. So just kind of hang in there. Now, GPS users, well, you know, we have this glancing blow from the solar storm plus these radio blackouts that could definitely give you some signal uh, reception issues. So if you're on Earth's night side, anytime during that solar storm, anywhere near Aurora, just stay vigilant and also anywhere near dawn or dusk near those terminators, because that could be an issue for reception too. And make sure if you are a drone flyer that you calibrate your magnetometers often. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.